when Nigeria is working, we will all know. PDP and us are diametrically opposed. Hi viewers, welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Adiola Fayoum. And we've been talking a lot about Africa in 2012, doing an in-depth Africa review. We've been looking at so many major events that happened in 2012, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we've also been discussing our projections for Africa in 2013, some things that we're hoping uh, to see manifest and some changes we're hoping to see. And so we've spoken earlier about Nigeria, we've spoken about Congo, and right now we want to speak about other countries like Burkina Faso, like uh, Guinea, and to talk with me about this is a Guinean American uh, who is actually a communication strategist but also specializes in contemporary African culture and politics. Please give it up for Maria Makaita. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Sahara TV. Yes, I'm glad to be here. It's good to have you. Yes. And you look so nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mariama, um, apart from other things that I've listed about you, you also do some stuff with the UN and I wanted to start from that because you actually just came back from um, Burkina Faso. Yes. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your trip to Burkina Faso? Yes, well I, I am part of um, the UN AIDS Bureau here in New York, um, working as a fellow um, and specifically working on projects dealing with Africa-focused projects on youth engagement in Africa. Okay. Um, and I was fortunate to work on a program which is all about um, implementing um, youth-led summit um, that is really focused on UNAIDS vision of zero discrimination, zero deaths, um, zero tolerance. It's called the three zeros. Mm. And so in this project, the goal was to really, you know, you know, harness and leverage, you know, the HIV agenda um, okay. throughout, you know, the region of Africa and utilize youth to do that. Mm. Um, so the final phase of this project was an actual trip to Burkina Faso, which um, the government of Burkina Faso um, committed and was honored to host over 250 leaders from across the five regions of Africa. Wow. Um, yeah, it was it was amazing. And it was a it was a three day summit. Um, which was December 20th to the 22nd. And what was your role in this summit? Well, my role was really, you know, implementing, coordinating, and doing all the logistical programming post and also pre within the UN, um, the UN office. So okay. it really was harnessing, you know, collectively teleconferences, you know, managing the operations of getting all the youth leaders on board, selecting who these youth leaders would be, in addition to working with an international committee of about 26 members. I know one of the major issues that uh, we have to address when it comes to Africa is AIDS and mm -hmm. uh, how to overcome that epidemic. And I feel like so many countries in Africa now are making uh, progress as far as that is concerned. I know there's still a lot that needs to be overcome. So uh, while we're talking about Africa Review in mm -hmm. 2012, I mean, we can't overlook this AIDS epidemic. So, yes. And I'm sure you have some pictures that you wanted to show us about about this yes. so, so in few seconds we're gonna put up some of her pictures yeah yes I would like to highlight though the reason why Burkina Faso was one of the places that this um, summit was hosted was because of celebrating you know President Blase Compare's um, you know accomplishments in decreasing um, the level of HIV AIDS cases in his country hmm. so that was added to the mission of you know what was it and what is it now um, as far as statistics I, I would have to kind of double check to give you accurate okay. numbers um, but I, I would say that you know it was a key point um, for the mission of the UNA team, mm. headed by you know the director, which is Michelle Sidibe, who really had a personal meeting with him. In addition to youth leaders, you know, congratulating him on his track record. But what do they do? What What are they doing that their own age uh, is reducing? I, I, I think the main the thing is is really um, it's um, prevention. It's also doing awareness programs on you know not being afraid to be fearful of of 
enlightening and educating people on your I'm status. Talking about, okay. um, and I think another key point element to this is why is youth, you know, it's sex education, you know, being open about, you know, expressing the pros and cons and things that you need to learn into how to improve the AIDS agenda within Africa, because there are still a lot of cultural taboos when yes. it comes to, you know, discussing yeah. your status. And so I think that it's a collective effort. Mm -hmm. um, that can be expanded and improved upon. Um, yeah. But the steps that they're making as a country as a whole, you know, is something to be, you know, acknowledged. Yeah, I, I, I like the way you just put it because looking back, African culture, like talking about sex, is, it used mm -hmm. to be like a real taboo. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad that we're now uh, getting over that. So uh, let's put up some of her pictures and you can just tell us uh, this first one, what's going on here? Well, this is um, the first, I guess, initial stages of opening, pre-stages of the summit. Okay. Um, there in the picture you have, you know, UNAIDS country officers, um, Adriana Houston, who is um, based in Senegal. You have Pasca, who's in the middle, um, with the black t-shirt. He's a UNAIDS country officer of South Africa. Um, and again, you know, they are very youth-oriented, youth-driven as being youth. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to have these people on board as team members. Um, here you have the second day of the summit, which is showing... There are a lot of people. Exactly. These are basically some of those 250 youth leaders who are engaging in candid discussions and just being a part of, you know, the panel discussions festivities. Great. And here? Here is the creme de la creme. These are all the political elites and high stakeholders of, of UNAIDS. Um, in the middle, in the blue suit, you have the UNAIDS executive director, Michelle Sidibe. Um, to his left, you have the prime minister of Burkina Faso. And to the right, you have you know, um, the brother of Brasse Compare and Jabril Diallo, who's, who I work for, who's my mm -hmm. boss, um, in the New York office of UNAIDS Bureau. So, um, and here? This is, again, the executive director of UNAIDS, Michelle Sidibe. Okay. Um, and who I would like to highlight is a very big supporter of youth. Um, he's all about social justice. He's all about not being afraid to take risks mm -hmm. and, being, and standing up for a cause, regardless of shaking you know, you may be shaking the bureaucracy in the chain, but it's important that youth, you know, make a, a stand. And this is a woman riding a motorcycle. Yes, and Burkina Faso, you know, inherently has a history of really, um, from um, Thomas Sankara, of women, the women's agenda. And so here, astonishingly, being in Burkina Faso, you have a huge population of women that ride motorcycles. Wow. And so it was really impressive to me. So I think this photo, you know, is very poignant, and especially in 2013, yeah. to see how women are key stakeholders in pushing, you know, Africa forward. And here? This is the Prime Minister okay. of Burkina Faso, and he was giving his keynote speech during the okay. panel discussion. Um, so, I mean, obviously we've seen how um, Burkina Faso has been trying when it comes mm -hmm. to fighting AIDS. Can you tell us uh, about other things, like um, is the government, what is the government uh, being responsible in terms of other issues such as um, just the basic amenities in terms of roads and electricity. I, I just would like to know and I want our audience to know what the situation is like now in Burkina Faso. I will say for me, I'll give a country comparison, you know, mm -hmm. being a, a diaspora from Guinea Conakry, I was utterly impressed, um, you know, visiting Burkina and seeing the differences. Although Burkina is, you know, a very landlocked country um, and on as far as the poverty scale is, you know, at a, at a lower tier and considering a country like Guinea who has a lot of, you know, resources and, and riches and resources. But I would say I was amazed how, you know, most of the roads were very much paved. As a country comparison, I saw so much more um, um, fire and so much more infrastructure development in Burkina Faso, considering mm. that they are considered as a resource um, country less yeah. rich than Guinea. Wow. So again, I, I will say that, you know, obviously when I was there also during my stay, there were a few, you know, power issues, electricity. So I think that's a recurring theme across the many emerging economies in West Africa. What, what do you think they need to work on in 2013 in Burkina Faso? Um, I will, I'm not going to limit it just to Burkina Faso. I think overall governments need to really put an emphasis on the needs of people. I think, you know, there are a lot of contracts and there are a lot of investment overall getting into a lot of these countries in Africa, considering the Chinese are there for business. Even in Burkina Faso? Even in Burkina Faso. Oh. I would say, I would say, you know, I'm not an expert on Burkina Faso, but I would say as far as overall the economic development of West Africa per se, you know, some are moving a lot more forward than others. Um, a lot of that all falls down to leadership, you know. It's governance. It's dis disseminating, yeah. you know, the resources and allocating the funding to the appropriate needs of the country's citizens. And I think that's a challenge, mm -hmm. 
in many African countries, not exclusive to Burkina Faso. I'm glad that you brought up Guinea, and I know that you're from Guinea, but I've mm -hmm. been getting a lot of mixed, um, should I say, reviews or reactions from uh, people from Guinea about their president. Mm -hmm. um, I just would like to hear <laughs> your view. Some people are telling me, oh, he's doing really well, he's making a lot of changes, and some people are just not buying it. I will say, you know, let's backtrack and give a little quick history. Um, yeah. You know, starting from, I would say, 2009, um, mm -hmm. the September Massacre, um, September 28th Massacre. I think that's when Guinea was put on the map on a global scale. Yes. Um, moving forward, you know, Guinea had their first democratic election in 2010. It was uh, an awarding and a an historic mon moment, and I think people were on a very, you know, new fronts of hoping that this would be the new face of Guinea. Yeah. Moving forward, you know, there were supposed to be a scheduled parliamentary elections six months later. Normally, it usually happens officially. It mm. never happens. Mm. Um, you have a lot of, you know, Guinea is still struggling with a lot of ethnic tensions and polarization, mm. which, you know, people have are not addressing as this one Guinea. It's mm. one identity. You know, I'm not Fula, I'm not Susu. And I think that reconciliation has yet to be pushed forward in the agenda. There's still a of tribe. Of yes. Um, exacerbated to that, you know, moving forward, now we're at a stage where in 2013, mm -hmm. there has been, you know, word, you know, off of a Voice of America report that I read stating that there are going to be scheduled parliamentary elections, okay. which until that happens, you know, Guinea is still in this fragile, hostile state. Um, I think a lot of people had a lot of promises that were given to them by this presidency, which were not delivered. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the representation of his government is very, you know, ethnically um, swayed in one direction. So I think regardless of what, you know, internal and what people's ethnic, you know, identities are into mm -hmm. their opinions of this country, if you look at the facts and see how he's leading thus far since 2010, you know, it's, it's, it's not going in a good direction. But some people have been arguing with me that uh, he's done a lot in terms of electricity and agriculture. Um, I, I'm someone who's been to Guinea in the past, within the last two years since the election until now. Um, and I will say, you know, growing up in a middle class family and, and living in a very, um, you know, affluent neighborhood in Guinea, fortunately, you know, we take turns in when we get our electricity. So I can say, I'm safe to say that that's not true. Um, really? And electricity, running water is a luxury in Guinea. And if you're part of the few that are able to have access to the things because you're able to afford and buy it, then that's okay, but that's not the case for the majority of Guinea. I had an opportunity to actually go into the villages of Guinea as well, in the Futa Jala region, which is, you know, ethnically predominantly Fula. And mm. I see, you know, the absence of governance um, in providing for its citizens. So I can speak from authority and experience, you know, and firsthand seeing with my own eyes that there's a lot to be done in Guinea. I know you work a lot with youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what about the youth of... Um Guinea, are they doing anything like a movement? Like, uh, I know you've been to Nigeria and we're going to talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit, but there was like a movement in January 2012, uh, we call it Occupy Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, most Nigerians were out um, protesting and a lot of them were young people. So um, do you foresee, uh, maybe in 2013 or maybe in the nearest future, do you foresee like young people getting up, uh, fighting for their rights and you know. I will say, I think in 2013, you know, across the board in many African countries, youth are the predominant numbers of population in Africa. So having that sense, source of strength in numbers, it's only up to youth to take the initiatives to, to make or see or create the country that they want to live in. I think now more than ever, I think youth have to take ownership of what they want their country to look like. And for some countries, they're a little bit more advanced than others. In Nigeria, there's more of a strong, you know, civil society movement among youth, whereas in Guinea, it's, it's fractured. Um, okay. You know, in Senegal, you know, the reason why they did so well in their election in 2012 is because of having a strong civil society, you know, role in making sure that country moved forward. And so at Senegal, is a classic example, and I think as well as Ghana, as mm. case studies to follow for other countries yeah. in reference to mobilizing youth. But youth are now more than ever in 2013, I think, the core element to transform Africa. So I have one, just one more question, but before I ask that, I just wanted to mm -hmm. ask you, uh, you your, your your projection or your views about Nigeria. I'm sure you're aware of so many uh, mm -hmm. major events that happened last year. If nothing, you're aware of so many um, bomb explosions by Boko Haram mm -hmm. and like the oil subsidy removal, and yeah. we're supposed to be the giant of Africa. I mean, yes. at least that's what we call yes. ourselves, you yes. know? 
Is that how other Africans see us? Do you guys see us like that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're from I Guinea. Would, Do you yeah, see no, us as, actually, as I giants? Would, I would say, you know, Nigeria should be the, the pearl of West Africa. Um, and as far as, you know, numbers, as far as economics, as far as like, you know, most of your, your wealthy, you know, you know, top tier African, you know, millionaires are based in that, in, are in that country. So I think as far as education, as far as diaspora numbers, you lead in so many areas. And I think, you know, people are expecting and wanting Nigeria to be, you know, the, the voice, the, the power force of, of, of transforming the West African continent or Africa as a whole. I, you know, I, people tend to always use corruption as an excuse. Um, and I think, you know, even in the United States, we have corruption here. But when it's systemic to the point where you're not allowed to maximize on the resources and the wealth that your country can offer and how they can transform the continent, mm -hmm. then that becomes a problem. So for me, you know, I, I admire Nigerians. Like, you know, I, I as a Francophone person who can who can assimilate into all different type of, you know, African countries because, you know, people tend to categorize Africa as one country and it's a continent. You know, there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned, but a lot of yeah. lessons to, to, um, to also take from Nigeria. And someone who's been, you know, in Nigeria, I'm just fascinated by the, you know, the vibrant, you know, culture, the vibrant, you know, life just, there's so much there to offer that you have a huge diaspora not only Africans, but, you know, friends of Africa, <laughs> as I call them, you know, going to Africa and Nigeria specifically for opportunities. So, you know, that speaks for itself. But as far as, you know, systemic corruption, it's got to get to a point where, you know, it doesn't harness, you know, the, the, the benefits for its people. And I think that's, you know, one of the huge challenges that Nigeria... That we have. Yeah. Well, my last question is, um, I'm sure that you're aware of the Vision 2015. Yes. And you're probably part of that as well, yes. right? So now that you've been to these various African countries, mm -hmm. uh, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Nigeria, and so on, do you do you think this is 2013? So two more years. <laughs> do you think that all these visions can be um, can be the, accomplished? Yeah. Do you think they yeah. can they can be fulfilled? They can be accomplished by 2015? Yeah. It's it's no. The answer is no. <laughs> Um, Who, who's at fault here? I mean, who's I, I not mean, doing think, what they should be doing? I, I think, you know, <laughs> the idea is you have to kind of think big. <laughs> you have to put the vision out there and then try as best as possible to, to maximize on it. Um, it's funny, I was last night reading the African Development Bank website and they actually did like a breakdown on where we are with these, you know, millennium sure. development goals and, you know, what what areas are moving forward and what are being stagnated. So I think, mm. I think with post-2015, particularly the UN development agenda, you know, it's now conversations of what now if we don't meet those goals? Um, mm. And what are ways to... And then we'll to, set another goal. <laughs> and ways to move forward. But I, I mean, I, I guess I will say that it's, it's more so, you know, the theoretical, you know, vision that, you know, like, like in your own personal life, you set these goals. You may not obtain them at the moment. Yeah, you but want at least to. you try a exactly. little. Exactly, you're trying to work yeah, towards them. Yeah, get so, the idea. So you know. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mary Emma, for coming on our show today and speaking about all these African countries. Are you going back to any African country anytime soon? Um. Well, coming up now is the you know also is the Africa Cup of Nations in South Africa. So you know. It's, so you're gonna be there. So we'll see. You know, I'm not sure okay. if I'll be able to be there, but we're working on possible potential programming activities on it. Okay, um, so come back up and. And talk, and talk to about, us about it. About it. <laughs> so viewers, talk about some football. <laughs> <laughs> so viewers, I'm sure that you've uh, really enjoyed Miriam Keita talking about um, Africa in 2012 and our projections and hope for Africa in 2013. So stay tuned. We have more programs coming up. Thank you.